everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel Kalanadi. Today I'm going to be finally talking about my favorite short fiction stories from the month of October. I started talking about my favorite short fiction back for my September favorites. This is a series of videos that I want to continue on my channel as I read a bunch of short stories, novelettes, and novellas in preparation for nominating in the next Hugo Awards. So this time around I tried to exclusively read uh, stories written and published in 2015 so that they're eligible for the next Hugo Awards. I know in my previous favorites video there were like two of the four stories weren't eligible but they were still my favorites. Um, in October I read over two dozen, almost three dozen short stories and some novellas and not as many of them really appealed to me so it was a bit harder for me to pick favorites that I can just like wholeheartedly uh, recommend to you guys, but I'm gonna try. So here are my four favorites that I would recommend to you guys. My absolute favorite piece of short fiction from this past month was Binti by Nnedi Okorafor. This is a novella published in September 2015 by Tor.com. They sent me an e-galley in exchange for an honest review, and I did do a review. I did a written review, and I did a video review, so I will send you to that if you want to know more. I do a lot of gushing about this novella. It was really, really good. It's a science fiction story about a young woman named Binti. She's from the Himba tribe in Africa. This is a futuristic story though. She's a math prodigy and she gets a place at an alien university on another planet and on her way there the ship that she is on is attacked by aliens and Binti has to use her abilities um, to survive and the traditions of her people become important in making a connection with the aliens and uh, communicating with them. It is a beautifully written, well-executed story. It really makes you realize that there is an art to writing a short story, to writing a novella. You can see, you can just tell when it's done well. Um, it just stands above all of the others. It also has a really great character, a type of character that you probably haven't seen in science fiction before. It does this beautiful blending of these Himba traditions with the science fictional, technological, and mathematical setting. Really the only fault I can find in this novella is that it should be longer. There should be more of it to explore this world more, to explain more, to go even more in depth. This, this whole scenario could really be expanded into a novel. So I'm really excited to read more things by Okora for, and yeah, I kind of hope that she would write like an actual novel in this world that she created for Binti. My other absolute favorite story of the month was just a short, fun story called The Bone War by Elizabeth Bear. It is published in this September-October issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. The Bone War is a Bijou the Artificer story. Bijou uh, has appeared in other short stories and novellas by Bear, including The Book of Iron and Bone and Jewel Creatures, which I've also read and really enjoyed. That's how I was introduced to this character. The stories are set in the same world as uh, Bear's Eternal Sky trilogy, but hundreds of years later in the 1910s or 1920s. Bijou is a wizard who specializes in rebuilding and reanimating skeletons. She wires together bones and then using her magical abilities she brings them back to life, she animates them, and many of her uh, reconstructed creatures assist her in her workshop. This is how one of her creatures is described. A jeweled, silver-chased giant centipede constructed from a ferret skull mounted on the spine of a horse with the ribs of cats for legs. The whole geared and wired for movement and animated by Bijou's signature magic. That's what she does with bones. But in this story, she is asked by an academic from the local museum to rebuild a dinosaur skeleton. Now, this is a project that will take years, and of course it's going to be slowed down by all the doctors squabbling academically about how the skeleton should actually be reassembled and what the dinosaur really looked like when it was alive. This is a very short story. It is standalone. You might appreciate the character more if you're familiar with her from other stories about Bijou, but if you want to read it first, it does stand on its own. And like I said, it's short. It's very enjoyable. It's just this episode from Bijou's life. And what makes it even more delightful is that there's clearly a big wink and a nod towards the real world bone war at the end of the 19th century, which is also called the Great Dinosaur Rush. This is like, Bear giving you 
her alternate history version of that through Bijou's experience. I really love this character. Bijou is at this point and in also one of the novellas a very old woman. She's in her 80s or 90s. She's a bit cantankerous. She has a lot of history and she's still creating these beautifully articulated creatures and the the magic that Bijou has, her ability and the creatures that she makes just appeal to me so much. My next favorite from October was another one of Tor.com's recently published novellas. This one was Of Sorrow and Such by Angela Slatter. This story follows a witch, Mistress Patience Gideon, who lives in the village of Edda's Meadow. While she helps her neighbors with her powers, she knows that if she is ever revealed to be a real witch or that she gives aid to other people with supernatural abilities, they will hunt her down and burn her at the stake. One night, a young woman who is a shapeshifter comes to Patience for aid. She has been very badly injured and she is dying. Patience saves her life and tells her, you cannot tell anyone what happened. But this young woman is a bit stupid. She does exactly what people tell her not to do and she is caught. She is revealed to be a shapeshifter and because of this she drags a whole bunch of the other women in the village including Patience and her adopted daughter Gilly into this witch hunt and Patience has to decide whether she's going to be out just for herself or whether she's going to stick around and put her own life in danger to aid her sisters, to aid this other witch in the story, or her adopted daughter, or another one of the shapeshifters. It's a bit dark. Yeah, it's quite dark, actually. Patience is not a nice woman. They are not nice people in the story. They are very realistic. They are out to save themselves sometimes and unapologetic about it. So, Essentially, I think the bones of the story was a little bit predictable. Witch is revealed to be a witch. Everyone wants to burn her at the stake. But it's how Patience reacts to this. It's the tone of the story, that dark atmosphere, and that she's not super likable sometimes that really drew me into this. This story was dark and unsettling but familiar enough for me to get into it. It was also very well paced and it had that feeling of completion by the time I was done with it and I enjoyed the characters so much I was really happy to find out that Slatter has written other stories about these characters and is set in the same world so I have to get my hands on those eventually. The final story that I want to recommend to you guys is The Insurrectionist and the Empress Who Reigns Over Time by Benjamin Sridanko. This was published in a recent issue of Beneath Sleeveless Skies and it is available online for free so I will link it for you down below. I'm going to recommend this one with some reservations because you may or may not be be aware of the controversies surrounding Suridanko and her history as an anonymous blogger and kind of her harassment of other authors. That seems to be in the past for her, but it is still kind of an issue in the SFF community, so I will warn you about that. Um, but also, while I think that the story is a, an interesting and good standalone introduction to Suridanko's style and the type of stories that she tells, it is not perfect by any means. I am recommending the story because of the way it's written, basically. I enjoy Sridankal's writing style, especially as she seems to have reached a better balance between her complex language, her very lush language, and comprehension and the plot itself. This story is about an insurrectionist named Yin San Hee who is taken prisoner by the Empress Narasorn who sews her lips shut so she cannot speak for 12 months and 12 days and then finally tells her what she wants the insurrectionist to do. And then of course Lady Love is kind of a thing that happens in a lot of Sri Danko's stories. Uh, most of the characters turn out to be female and in relationships or gender swapping type of things, which is really interesting to read. It was some Her fiction was some of the first stuff I read that did that and I quite appreciate it. I think it's a, done to a very good effect in her stories. But the plot the actual motivations of the characters, like why the Empress wants Yin San Hee to do this to her own kingdom, I didn't think that was explained very well. I didn't feel lost when I was reading the story, but when I was done with it, I was like, how do I explain what actually happens in this? I'm not exactly sure. But the way the story is told is very beautiful. I think this is from a storytelling tradition 
uh, maybe one of those like Chinese or Japanese storytelling traditions, kind of like The Grace of Kings by Ken Liu now that I think about it, where you get a lot of this sweeping high level detail, you're almost at a distance from the characters being told what's going on, and it doesn't quite reach the personal level where you make a connection, a real emotional connection with what's going on inside of the characters' heads. So it's different. I'm just going to say it's different, but the way that Sri Danko is describing th things in such detail with these luxuries and this lushness always juxtaposed against the violence and the blood and not so nice things, I like the effect that that creates. This is just one of those stories that while it was flawed, it has stuck in my mind. It definitely created an impression that hasn't gone away very quickly. And while I have reservations about Sri Danko as a person, perhaps, I'm still very curious about her writing style and what she will write in the future. So I will keep reading her as long as she is published. Those were the four stories I read in October that I wanted to tell you guys about. Like I said, I read a lot of short stories in October and a lot of them just weren't quite amazing enough to make the cut for me to talk about them in this video. So I might leave some links to some other stories, runner-ups, honorable mentions in the description box down below so you can take a look at some of those. And as always, if you have any recommendations of your own for short stories that I should read, please leave them in the comments. I'll be back with more favorites probably at the beginning of December to go over what I read in November. Hopefully I won't be as late next time. And until then, until my next video, bye.